Do you want to get more out of life? Today, we're going to show you how to get more out of life than you could ever need. Welcome to Retirement Revealed. I'm your host, Jeremy Kyle, and we're here to turn your retirement savings into retirement income. Today, we're talking with Scott Ferguson about how to live a life of abundance. Scott, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Jeremy. Yeah, well, let's uh, get the secret out there. How do you get more out of life? <laughs> Well, there's a lot of steps you have to take. It's not a uh, destination de destination so much as a journey. Uh, so, you know, I can definitely go through those steps. But I think the first step is starting with appreciating everything you have. You know, the analogy I like to use is imagine you did a thousand piece puzzle and there was one piece missing when you got to the end. We tend to really hate that missing piece. And a lot of times in our life, we can have that same mindset of if everything's not perfectly put together, we don't feel appreciative of what our situation is. We tend to focus and dwell on that missing piece. And, um, you know, with, with everyone posting their vacations and their houses and their pools on social media, it can often feel like we're missing quite a few pieces. Right. <laughs> and so, um, I think the first step is appreciating what you already have and not focusing and dwelling on the things you don't. Yeah, that's the first step of the nine steps you wrote in your book. Uh, before we get there to all of those, maybe just tell us a little bit more about yourself and and how you turned out to be uh, become a book author. Yeah, you know, I've been a wealth advisor for nearly a decade, and uh, when I had cl I've had thousands of client meetings, and sometimes you meet with someone and you think man, they're doing a lot of things right. They have the right mindset. And so I decided to write a book about living the abundant life. And that originally came from John 10, 10 B, where Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And my big question was, well, first of all, that sounds great, but what does that look like and how do you do it? And so by using, uh, by thinking through clients that I've met over the years and things that they've done, uh, using my own personal stories as well as biz biblical wisdom, I wanted to put together a, a framework of how you can get on a path towards uh, living the abundant life. Yeah, and speaking of your path, uh, I see in the notes here that you went to law school, but here you are, a wealth advisor. How how did that come about? <laughs> yeah, you know, I was in uh in law school. My focus was on. Uh, mediation, negotiation, alternative dispute resolution. And I ended up getting certified as a family law mediator, which was mediating the division of assets upon a divorce. And just seeing how much uh, money affected people's lives, I really decided I wanted to go more upstream and see if I could work with couples to have money bring them together uh, rather than tear them apart. And I had a I had a job uh, when I was working out in California with a, and a bunch of my assistant managers were stressed about money. I'd always kind of been passionate about being wise with money. And one of, you know, with all my assistant managers kind of stressed out, I finally asked like, what's going on guys? And they all pretty much said something to deal with money problems. And so I said, you know, I'm happy to sit down with you, create a budget, walk you through some different strategies for your 401k. And one of the guys, um, this is years after law school, one of the guys came up to me and said, listen, I'm not going to go over my personal expenditures with you. And I said, well, that's that's a totally okay thing. It's kind of awkward to share all that with your boss. So I get it. And he goes, no, 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 it's fine. I trust you, but my wife and I are getting divorced. Mm -hmm. And so everything's about to change. And I said, well, I don't want to get into your sex life or anything like that, but I would love to sit down with you and your wife on a weekly basis for a couple months and just talk about money problems and see if that has any positive impact. And to their credit, they started coming in every week and we started with mindset before we got into strategy and we were able to really work together. And as I was going through that, it was just, this is what I was called to do. This is what I love. And, you know, today, roughly 10 years later, that couple's still together. And so um, as I was going through that process, I told my wife, this is what I got to be doing. And she said, I was wondering when you'd figure that out. So <laughs> she was very supportive and that started my uh, career and going to be an advisor. Oh, that's great. Uh, and it's a great 
great story that focusing kind of on some things together really helped this couple out. And you also mentioned just that phrase adjusting or helping with their mindset. That's kind of the tagline of your book. It's uh, the book is living the abundant life, adjusting your mindset and finances to live the life you've always desired. Uh, one thing I love about it with this term abundant is you turn the word abundant life or the word abundant into uh, an acronym. And you talked about the different things, appreciate what you have, of course, is number one. And we'll go through uh, a lot of those, but tell me a little bit more just about the kind of the mindset uh, piece of it. And I guess I, I, I teased the, the intro saying that you can get more out of life than you could ever need. And I'm guessing your thought is, well, if you just need less, you'll always have enough. <laughs> Yeah, that could be a part of it. I think I like to start with mindset. Um, when you think about mindset, you have your core beliefs, right? And your core beliefs affect your feelings, which affect your actions. So for example, if your core belief is that I need lots of money to be happy, then your feelings will most likely be, be that of inadequacy as you compare yourself to everyone who seemingly has everything you don't. And then your actions will be to do whatever it takes to get your hands on as much money as you can uh, and at the expense of spending time with your family and different people in your life that could bring you joy. However, if your core belief is that God owns everything, then your feelings are that of feeling blessed, feeling um, that you know everything is a gift that you have currently in your life, and then your actions will be that of generosity and stewardship. And when you think about all the messages that we get exposed to on a daily basis about you need this car to feel cool or you need this uh, pool to have fun or you need this or you need that. There's a lot of noise that's right at going right at your core belief to think differently. And so I think it's important to get a message out there to try to challenge some of those core beliefs and realize that, you know, things are pretty good. If you think about you need more money to be happy well, if you look worldwide, if you're earning 44000 or more as a household, you're in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. So are you saying that the amount you have right now isn't enough to be happy, which would mean 99% of the world shouldn't be happy with what they're getting, right? And so we got to challenge some of those core beliefs and change our mindset, which I think will give us a different perspective and how we see money and how we see the world. Yeah, uh, for sure. So you, you talked about first appreciating what you have and then thinking through your beliefs, especially your core beliefs and uh, getting back to, I guess, the first part, appreciating what you have. Uh, you share a story in your book about how your life changed dramatically freshman year of college, which is already a big kind of change <laughs> of life time. But but what happened uh, back in freshman year that, that really kind of um, shifted your mind a bit? Yeah, my, my first week of college, I went to the University of Minnesota on a track and field scholarship. And as part of being on the track and field team, we had to have a sports physical, you know, something that athletes are pretty used to, uh, especially at that age. And uh, in that sports physical, they found a little lump in my throat and after uh, or a little lump in my neck. And after a couple of weeks of lots of different tests, um, I found out I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. And so you know, your first couple of weeks, you're just, you know, you're, you have all this worry and anxiety of like, what am I going to major in? Uh, am I going to meet a girl? Am I going to have good friends? I wasn't definitely not thinking about more, my mortality in those first uh, few weeks of college. But I got to say that after going through that, and luckily they caught it extremely early, ended up being a centimeter, less than a centimeter in diameter, had radiation, had surgery right away. So I'm good now, thankfully. Uh, but that really got me to focus on like, today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad onto it. Um, every day is a blessing. And and my hope is, you know, people don't have to go through something catastrophic to have that same appreciation. So my grandfathers lived to 104 and 96. Both of them fought in World War II. And I think those two, I saw it in their eyes that, they had a greater appreciation for life, I think, because of what they went through. And so, you know, what I've found through clients and through my own personal um, experiences is that gratitude 
is a muscle that needs to be exercised daily and making a regular habit of being grateful and naming things that uh, you're grateful for helps your mind stay focused on the things that are important. Yeah, that uh, that daily gratitude is part of uh, reflections. Each chapter you end with some reflections. I like how that's uh, in there. I'm just a, I'm a kind of person that just wants to almost read a book. Like I can count as a win. Like I read a book and I, and that's a win for me, I guess. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm constantly re being reminded by my kids, teachers who say, okay, after every few pages, get your kid to reflect. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm needing to have that reminder myself. So I'm glad you built in that reminder, that reflection, uh, piece of it. I know that, uh, one of your reflections is is encouraging that daily uh, gratitude. Um, and that's part of the first couple of chapters uh, that you can download from your website. Why don't, why don't you tell people how they can get the, the first couple of chapters of their uh, of your book there? Yeah, if you go to AbundantLifeBook.com, uh, it'll link you to our website where you can download the first, I think it's two chapters in there. Uh, the first chapter is setting the stage. The second chapter is appreciating what you have. Um, and there's a free download of those first few chapters to at least give you a taste of some of the steps to on the journey towards the abundant life. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned your grandparents, uh, your granddad's living to, I guess, 100 on average. One of your chapters <laughs> is about navigating your short and long-term plans. I think when you've got 100-year-olds in your uh, your DNA, uh, that, that long-term plan means a little bit different <laughs> for <laughs> For, for you perhaps, but tell me more about navigate your short and long-term plans. What should people be looking for there? Yeah. Well, and just to respond to the hundred year old plan, you know, a lot of times when people turn 65, one thing you don't hear is, man, that person has a lot of potential. You know, we, we tend to save the word potential for a 20 year old or a 19 year old. And I love that word potential because when you retire, and I know you do a lot of great work in retirement planning, you know, when you're 65, you have time, you know, you have wisdom from a lot of years of uh, being around, and then you also most likely have resources. And so that's a, that's a pretty stellar combination. Um, when I talk about, so my first two chapters, appreciate what you have and believe everything's a gift of God, that those are what I would consider foundational, right? The, the next three chapters are a little bit more financial of understand where you're trying to go, navigate that short and long-term plan, and then develop a strategy for risk. And that, that navigate the short and long-term plan really comes out of creating a clear and concise vision for uh, not only where you want to go, but who you want to be and the impact that you want to have. And then from there, once you have a clear vision of that, that's where the navigating the plan uh, comes into fruition in that, you know, what do they say? Um, a wish without, or a, a goal without a plan is a wish. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so the, the taking the time to create those plans and those strategies to help you get to where you are, to where you want to go is important. And, you know, you know, with doing retirement planning, a lot of folks will spend more time planning out their summer vacation. They do what the retirement will look like. And so it's important to, if you clearly have a vision of who you want to be and the impact that you want to make, take the time to figure out how you're going to align your time, your resources uh, to that vision. And the re reason I use the word navigate is because things are always changing, not just the financial landscape that we're in, but also priorities can change. You know, you might have a new grandkid and all of a sudden, funding their college might be more important than going on another vacation. So the reason I like the word navigate is because things are always changing. So you can't just set a one-time plan and never revisit it. Yeah. I like how the order of it, you, you go through and encourage uh, creating a vision and then figuring out how the short and long-term plans go into that vision. And what I found happens a lot is people aren't really focused on kind of the the time frame aspect of it. They're just asking, what's a good stock? Okay, well, do you even need to have a stock, right? Uh, yeah. Should the money be in the bank? Or working at the best interest rate, should the money even be in an interest rate? So that that dichotomy of splitting up the short and long-term plans is a, is a good way to go. And of course, um, the next piece is developing a strategy for risk. I think part of that's probably capturing the risks that are out there. And theoretically, you get paid for risk. That's what the stock market is. You get paid for taking the risk. You can't 
you can't have the chance to make money unless you have the risk of uh, losing money. Uh, but especially uh, since you had that health scare, I imagine part of your your thoughts on strategy for risk are to uh, find the risks that you can't really kind of prepare for or you know diversify away. And, and I, I imagine there's some insurance aspect there too. Do you, do you mind sharing about that? Yeah, when you think about creating a clear vision and then creating a strategy, um, a lot of people could do that, but then they still won't take any action. And the number one reason they won't take action is because of fear. Right. And so fear is, you know, something mentioned in the Bible quite a bit about do not fear. Uh, it seems that God and Jesus understood that people live with a lot of fear. And so when you think about how do you get to that abundant life, if you know who you want to be and you have a strategy to get there, but you're afraid to take that first step, you're never going to get on that path. And so I think it's very important to write out what your fears are and then create a strategy of how you're going to overcome them. You know, I think I've heard you say similar, but it's not about the probability of bad things going or happening. It's what would the consequences be if they did mm -hmm. and how through specific planning, can you mitigate those consequences to a point of being okay with them? And so if you're wanting to start your own business, but you're afraid that not a lot of income will be come in the first six months, well, then maybe the strategy is to save six months worth of income or more so that you feel comfortable to go about and take that leap um, and go do what you've been called to do. And so sometimes your fears are really not realistic. They're your imagination of the worst case scenario that does have a low probability. And so understanding what are your actual fears? What are you actually afraid of? What's keeping you from being the best you can be? Writing those down and creating a strategy for overcoming them. You know, in the book, I talk about David and Goliath, which I think everyone knows that story. And I love that David used the confidence of fighting lions and stuff in his past to give him confidence. And I love that he gazed at how big God was and how little Goliath was in comparison. But I also love his strategy of bringing a, uh, a sling to a, a slingshot, basically to a sword fight. You know, mm -hmm. if he would have just said, oh, I guess most people in this scenario use swords, he probably would have lost. So I, I like the strategy that he utilized, that he took some time to think about what are my strengths and how do I be the best version of myself to overcome some of those fears. And so taking that time to purposely and intentionally think through your fears maybe pray about them, but also create strategies to overcome them, I think is an extremely important step that most people don't take the time to to focus on. Well, and part of it, my wife's an elementary school counselor. So I hear a lot of the psychology piece of it and she's talking to little kids, but it it is the same for us adults where uh, half the time just naming the fear almost solves the issue, right? Just putting a name to it or, or thinking of it. And of course, the other half the time having a strategy uh, for it. If you can't name the fear and say kind of what's the problem, then you, how could you possibly know what strategy, whether it's, uh, if we're talking financial, you know, and investing or spending less or, or buying some insurance or whatever uh, it might, might be. So that's, that's interesting. I don't know if I've heard the, um, kind of the, the strategy piece of David and Goliath ever, uh, <laughs> ever preached on a Sunday. It's more of the, uh, you know, the, the confidence and, you know, faith in God, uh, type of stuff. But yeah, he was a, a wise person to, to show up with, um, a little bit of guerrilla warfare, I suppose, to the, uh, yeah, there you go. the right, right situation. Yeah. yeah. Well, talking about strategy and you mentioned where retirement, uh, a few times, uh, I'm just curious, how do you envision spending your retirement? Oh my goodness. That's, a, that's a great question. I, I love to teach and I, I imagine that even when I retire, I will still be involved, whether right now I teach a high school class, which I'm really enjoying. Uh, I use curriculum with the Ron Blue Institute teaching biblical personal finance for high schoolers, which has been a really fun uh, class to to uh, uh, teach. But I imagine myself doing some teaching. Uh, my wife has already told me that if our kids move away, we will be having at least an apartment or something wherever they are. So I imagine being very involved in my kids' lives. Mm -hmm. uh, Eloise is nine and Otto is seven. So I imagine being very involved in their their lives. And then I love coaching youth sports. So it's something I've done with my kids, but I imagine helping coach or volunteer coach for different teams, whether it's at a 
you know, high school or something like that. Um, and then, you know, my wife and I are really uh, focused on impact. And so I try to do that with financial education, but, you know, I think we're always trying to ask ourselves, what's the impact we can make and where's God opening doors for us to do that. So I imagine something dealing with some international travel and some, uh, mission, you know, mission strategy, uh, in there as well. So. Got it. Well, I think you've got more of a vision than the plans. Cause of course it seems like it's a bit of ways with nine-year-olds and seven-year-olds, seven-year-olds. And I, I like that you're, you're kind of living the life you're practicing what you preach. Cause you put in, uh, in the book, uh, that part of the abundant life is nurturing others and taking time for the people in your life and with all those mentions of educating and coaching and finding a way to spend time with your kids, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, you're, you're definitely, uh, uh, living that piece of it. But I want to ask about the kind of the last chapter, the last part of the abundant life, which is the word life, live your life with joy. Uh, tell me more, more especially about the, the joy part. How do you live your life with joy? Yeah. One of the ways we define the abundant life is more joy and less worry. I think it's hard to do both at the same time. And so, whereas the first couple of chapters are what I called foundational, the next few are kind of more financial. The last three are more behavioral of, you know, not living in the past or the future, living in the present, nurturing others uh, and taking time with loved ones. And I think living your life with joy naturally becomes something that happens once you've gone through those previous steps. Uh, where you have a clear vision of where you want to go, you're actually living it out. And uh, one of one of the things I find interesting is that the worst penalty in our society is essentially solitary confinement, right? So our worst penalty in our society is being alone. And studies have shown that um, loneliness can be as negative as alcoholism or drug abuse. And so, uh, once you put all of that together of having a clear vision, being appreciative of what you have, um, focusing on helping others, having impact, I think that's when you start to have more joy and less worry um, in your life. Yeah, I, I like it. It's good, kind of a good uh, summary then of the uh, the abundant life. And of course, uh, you mentioned how to get those first two chapters. We like to educate as well too on the retirement reveal podcast. So what we'll do is the first three people that email me podcast at kylefp.com. We're going to send out to you a copy of Scott's book. That's the, uh, how to live a life of abundance. And we're going to, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes. So if you, if you aren't one of the first three, uh, you won't be out of luck. Uh, it <laughs> just, uh, we'll, we'll be clicking the, uh, the Amazon buying there for the, uh, the first three people that email us the podcast at Kyle FP for, uh, for Scott's book. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Well, I've got one more question for you, Scott. Before that, tell us what's the best way for people to reach out to you. Yeah, our firm is AbundantLifeFinancial.com. And so that's the easiest place to get in touch with us. Our phone number's on there as well. And um, yeah, we work with a lot of people all over the country. So that's great. And of course, if you'd like uh, more ideas on how to make your retirement great, just go ahead right now, click that subscribe button uh, for Retirement Revealed. All right, Scott, we got one final question for you. Tell us something about yourself that few people know about. And remember, this podcast is rated clean. <laughs> uh, something that few people know about. Um, oh, that's a good question. I think the I, I think that I'm I think the one thing that a lot of people don't know about me because you know, I was a D1 athlete at some point. I don't necessarily look like it anymore. So I think the one thing that not a lot of people know nowadays is that I, I'm just a gym rat. I love, you know, that's why I love coaching youth sports. I could be on a field or in a, or on a court all day long and and never get tired of it. So that's, that's definitely something that uh, I enjoy. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for coming on the show, kind of teaching us how to live the abundant life. And um, I, lo I love alliteration and acronyms. And so the, the, to take the uh, word abundant and, and turn it into that where you appreciate what you have, believe everything is God's, understand where you're headed, navigate your short long-term plans, develop a strategy for risk, acknowledge the past, nurture others, and take time for the people in your life. And of course, life, live your life with joy. Uh, that's a great, uh, great set of uh, words, great set of wisdom to live by. 
Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Kyle or Jeremy. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. And uh, of course, thank you for listening to the Retirement Reveal podcast. We believe if you know more about your money, you will feel better about your money and you will make better money decisions. Mm -hmm.